Um, terrific. Okay. Hey, everybody. This is Daniel Stein. Uh, welcome. Uh, we'll get started now. It's a couple minutes after. Actually, we already started. We'll we'll continue the starting of of today's uh, webinar. Welcome back. This is the second one of 2020. We're excited about looking forward to uh, a new year and new topic, and especially a new domain coming on board with. Uh, with health and we're really really delighted about uh, uh robert's willingness and enthusiasm to join us today and so we have a a, a jam-packed uh, schedule um so with that let me um uh just uh say i think everyone's mostly muted here um you can unmute yourself we're looking for um participation and the like um really excited today about the about today's uh, uh um, uh, conversation. It, it fits so much into what we've been doing now for the last six, eight months, <coughs> excuse me, and longer <coughs> with, um, with, the, with the webinars and the Let's Get Technical. The conversation of Neem and Fire and how they work together has come up quite a bit over, over the last couple of months. And um, so we're really excited about the opportunity to uh, dive into this conversation, <coughs> start diving into the conversation today and uh, and uh, see where it's going, learn about where it's going, what the status of it is, and how it can uh, really serve our purposes. And I know everyone on the call is interested in coming to this conversation from various perspectives. So um, let's dive into a couple of housekeeping things really quickly. Most of this stuff is probably obvious to everybody. Um, keep yourself on mute, um, but as you uh, want to engage, uh, please, uh, please do so via the chat bar. Uh, which you should be able to find in the nav navigation bar. Um, you can write your questions in there. Um, you can raise your hand uh, to um, to ask a question. And if all of those don't uh, don't uh, suffice, feel free to break into the conversation uh, with uh, with something that you want to say. <coughs> As we all know, hold on one second. <clears throat> As we all know. Um, you know, webinars like this are uh, a, a little unnatural for conversation. So sometimes it can be a little awkward to bring your voice into the conversation, but <laughs> feel free to do that. <clears throat> I may lose my voice altogether here. Um, so we are recording the uh, the uh, the, uh, the call here, and we will be posting this on the hub. Uh, and you see the URL there. I do hope that everyone on the call has joined the hub. That's an easier way to communicate with folks about the upcoming webinars, and there's a lot of good stuff that's growing on the at, that's being added to the hub every day. So, um, with that, um, what uh, what we've been doing in the past uh, is doing some brief introductions. We have a, a particularly uh, large group here today, and I think a bunch of new people saying. Um, <coughs> um, so, what we've been trying to do is introductions. Uh, what we'll do is we'll take a few minutes, see how many we can quickly pack in just to get a voice and a name together on that, but we want to spend a bunch of time on the actual Neem Health domain. And so after doing a little tiny introduction, uh, we'll give a, a very brief overview of the NIC for people who are new to it, and then we'll turn the bulk of our attention and time to the actual uh, discussion around the, the new proposed Neem Health domain. And Kate Ryan of uh, Myers Health Solutions will provide a uh, an introduction. Uh, she was on last week. She was gracious enough to sort of do a little preview for us there, and then um, and then Robert uh, will provide a, a more deeper dive into it. Uh, and then we'll we're planning and designing it so that we have a, a good chunk of time to be talking and, com and conversing. But um, I, I suspect we will have more questions and more conversation than time may permit. So uh, we may ask uh, Robert and company to uh, come back at another time and to continue the conversation if necessary, um, <clears throat> both online and potentially on the webinar here. So let's try to do something quickly here, um, which is uh, uh, just to get your voice, uh, your name here. And I said, we're just going to spend a little time here. So the way we like to do this is um, <clears throat> just type your name into the chat bar and I'll call on you and just say, kind of hear your voice, where you're from, what you do, really just a few sentences, especially since we have a full house here today. And if uh, generally it's for new folks. So if anyone would like to start, uh, we'll, I'll just go from the chat bar here and go for it. If there's anyone here that wants to introduce themselves. 
<clears throat> okay, quick, let's go. Gene. <clears throat> Sometimes you have to double unmute yourself. All right, Gene, while you're working on unmuting, uh, Tom Carlson. Man, you wouldn't think it would be that hard to unmute. Okay, so I'm Tom Carlson. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a consultant. I've worked on meme stuff um, for as long as there's been a meme. Um, I've worked extensively with the human services domain and its predecessor, <coughs> Cyphus domain. Um, I'm very, very interested in the health domain. Um, I'm also very, very interested in the upcoming potential statistics domain. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in a whole lot of meme stuff. Fantastic, nice modeling. Uh, Gene, are you back? Are you on? Okay, maybe not. I'll look for your uh, your um, your phone number and or your name, and I'll unmute you. Jonathan Hare. I think this is more complicated than it appears to be. <clears throat> All right, moving along to John Forrester. Hi, John Forrester here, program manager. I'm uh, supporting Kate Ryan and team on HHS and NEEM efforts. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Nikolay. Uh, good afternoon, Nikolai Lipsky, CDC Center for Preparedness and Response. I work with NEEM for the last couple of years, as well as <coughs> many SDOs for development of health uh, domain, as well as emergency preparedness domain. Thank you. Fantastic. Hey, hi, Seth. Seth, welcome. Uh, Hi, it's good to, good to hear you guys. Uh, Seth Foldy, uh, I've been involved in primary care and primary care administration, public health and informatics kind of iteratively. Uh, worked uh, at local, state and federal level. Currently at Denver Public Health as the Director of uh, Epidemiology, Informatics and Preparedness and involved in our um, social health information exchange efforts in this community in Colorado. Fantastic, welcome. Good to hear you again, it's been a while. Carolyn. Hi, is this Caroline Fickenberg uh, from UCSF, the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network. Um, strongly also involved in the Gravity Project, working on standards development related to social determinants of health for um, mostly the health IT world. Great to be on the call. Thanks, hey, welcome. Mylin. I am um, a little out of order here. Mylan Tufty with the North Dakota Department of Health. I also am the policy chair for population health and informatics at ASTO and sit on the Digital Bridge um, Governance Committee. Fantastic. Forrest White. Hello, Forrest White from Altarum Institute in Michigan. Uh, we're a uh, I um, work with a lot of interoperability national standards. Um, I'm following gravity, as a matter of fact, as well. Um, PASIO project, ELTSS, um, standards-based interoperability is our um, focus, or mine at least. Thanks. Fantastic. Tonya. Aguilar. Surprised you there, huh? All right, while you're looking for the unmute button, Ginger. Hey there, this is Ginger Zielinski, um, now uh, CEO of Evergreen Strategic Advisors, formerly the CEO of Benefits Data Trust, care about all things related to um, data to increase access and better serve people. Welcome. And I see Terry Cullen on the phone. Great. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Uh, former CIO at Indian Health Service, 25 years as a public health service officer, working mostly now in low and middle income countries with uh, open health information exchange and everything related to health and justice. Okay. Great. Welcome. <clears throat> uh, next up here. Uh, let's see, Brian Dowski. No, Brian Sadowski. Melanie Epstein. Sorry. Hi, this, this is Melanie Epstein Corbin. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry about that. This, uh, this is Brian Sadowski with uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, at the Ideals Institute. Oh, great. Welcome. <clears throat> nice to hear your voice. And Melanie. 
Melanie Epstein Corbin. I'm the Electronic Case Reporting Coordinator with the California Department of Public Health, and we are uh, California's one of the uh, original digital bridge sites for piloting ECR. So we are working on scaling ECR. Thanks. Scaling ECR. Oh, cool. Great. Uh, Scott Galen. This is Scott Glott of WebShield, Vice President of Trust, really working to help uh, break down the barriers for data silos, give personal um, user interest into our data use cases across healthcare and other domains as well by opening up innovation to organizations. Fantastic. Um, uh, let's see, Lux. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I'm Lux Fatak. Um, I, my previous experience has been in public health and also electronic health record. I was working for NetSmart. So I do have uh, experience both in HIT and public health. Thank you. Hey, welcome. <clears throat> Amanda? Okay, we're moving right along. Um, an abundance of new participants here. Rim, Cochran. Morning, this is Rim Cothran. Um, I'm uh, the executive director for the California Association of Health Information Exchanges and also an independent consultant working with state and local government, mostly over on the uh, West Coast. Um, primary interests are in clinical interoperability, but also in disaster response, social determinants, and do some work in population health and CIE. Great, great, welcome. <clears throat> Craig. Hi, my name is Craig Antico. I'm the founder of RIP Medical Debt. We buy and abolish medical debt for the poor and those in hardship. We've abolished about $1.5 billion of debt so far. And we're working with 211 San Diego and their community information exchange to see if we can help people directly, more directly. Right now, it's, a, it's really a, a random act of kindness in whatever portfolios we buy, but we're going to start targeting people. We want to make sure that we understand the data. Interoperability. Yeah. That's great. <clears throat> okay, a few more folks. I'm noticing, I think we actually have exceeded our limit on uh, on Zoom here. We're at 100 participants, and I think um, I think we I think our license is 100, so I'm not sure other people can get on. Um, I, there is a phone number. I think you can join by phone. So if folks have colleagues that they want to bring in, um, uh, we can you can put up that phone number. Uh, Sunday, maybe you can post the phone number there, and then we can uh, people can join by audio. Um, I apologize for that uh, limitation there. Um, again, we will record it and we'll send out a note to folks as well. <clears throat> Sorry about that, uh, Terry Fountain. Uh, um, Maybe not. Okay. So, um, Daniel, uh, Terry, Terry hey. actually wrote in the chat that um, she's okay. having trouble with her mic. So she's from Senate uh, okay. Health Committee in California. Okay, great. Wonderful. Terrific. Um, have I, uh, any, any other folks here who haven't introduced themselves quickly? Uh, this is Walt Pastor, and uh, I'm with the EP3 Hello. and WebShield, work with Scott Gallant. And we're trying to Great. solve a lot of these data interoperability issues. So glad to be here again. Excellent. Excellent. Great. Hi, hi, Daniel. This is Jean Hall. I'm um, with Casper, the Kentucky's Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. Um, and I'm also the ex chair of the executive committee of the, uh, the Prescription Dr Monitoring Information Exchange Standards Organization, which is a state-run PDMP standards organization that uses NEMA as the base for its information exchange. Fantastic. <clears throat> hey, Daniel, this is Sirag Bhatt uh, from FEI System. I'm Chief Innovation Officer. We are based in Columbia, Maryland, and we work with uh, several states and counties in, in reference to uh, long-term support services as well as behavioral health. Uh, so this is a very interesting topic, and we've been trying to work on interoperability of those domains with the primary care domains. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Hi, good morning. Yep. Hi, this is Sonia Aguilar. Um, I'm a um, business architect with the California Health and Human Services Agency, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about NEAM. 
Fantastic. Hi, this is Stephanie Arnson. I'm a product services manager for the Interoperability Institute, which is a newer company within the Michigan Health Information Network, or MIHIN. Excellent. Going once, anyone else wants to say hello? Hi, this is Catherine Escobar. I'm the Deputy Managing Director for the NEAM Management Office. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. <clears throat> And you've got a nice base behind your uh, your phone there, so <laughs> we'll know who it is. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, so I think we can. Uh, this is impressive and uh, delightful to have so many people on the call from so many different places. Uh, it expands the conversation. Um, hopefully today, both on the webinar and then also online. So with that, um, we'll get started. Um, and uh, again, folks, I'll put in the phone number here for folks who are not able to get on. Uh, I've asked uh, us to send out that, that message again uh, so that people can go join by, at least by phone. Um, and I'll, I'll add the note here. If you have other folks who are wanting to join, they can, I think they can dial in. I don't think there's any limitation to that. Um, so just a bit of background uh, here um, in terms of uh, the collaboration uh, and folks who've been on before have seen this. Uh, just a, a, a brief moment. So Nick is uh, is supported by the Kresge Foundation, and we've been able to build a, a, a platform and a collaboration to bring people together across multiple domains. And we uh, we refer to them as the six domains: human services, public health, education, public safety, emergency medical response, and healthcare IT. Um, and uh, recognize that we are organizing the world into these uh, approximate domains. Obviously, lots of specific programs uh, are under some of these, and I know many of them would would uh, would uh, advocate and lobby for having uh, their own domain uh, in order to try to organize this uh, and to sort of focus on those things that are both common and different between the domains. Uh, we wrote a paper for him a couple of years ago, which is off to the right here, trying to articulate some of the high-level things that are the same and different so that we can begin to uh, look across domains, both within our domains, but also across domains and see what ways we can actually expedite that communication. I think today's webinar and others we've had is really exemplary in that regard in terms of trying to really recognize how to share both within and across and hopefully stop uh, duplicating as, as appropriate. Um, we refer to ourselves as a community of networks. We recognize that there are many networks out there within the individual domains and programs and we're not trying to uh, usurp any of those. We're just saying there's a way that the community of networks can come together and, and more effectively share information over time. Um, there's plenty more to read and see about that, both on the website and in the documentation. Uh, but that is, our, that is really our purpose, and everything we're doing is trying to focus on that cross-domain collaboration, and, um, and hopefully we're making some progress in that area. All right, so without further ado, what I'd like to do is shift our focus and attention to, uh, to the presentation. And um, with that, I've asked Kate Ryan from Iris Health Solutions to um, uh, just give us a, a, a couple of minutes on a little bit of background, some of it she covered last week, just to set up the, the, the broader, wider conversation with Robert. And with that, Kate, are you here and are you unmuted? I am here and I'm unmuted. Excellent. Um, Thank you, Daniel. And hello, everyone. It's great to see so many uh, familiar names and so many new uh, people as well. Um, so I'm Kate Ryan. I'm with Iris Health Solutions. I'm a health IT consultant. Um, and Iris supported um, an eco line of business called the Federal Health Architecture for about 10 years, uh, which was managed by ONC as well as HHS's um, Office of the Chief Information Officer, uh, so the Social Security Administration, Veterans Health Administration, and the Defense Health Agency. Um, one of the initiatives that we worked on uh, was the National Information Exchange Monitors, uh, Models Health Community of Interest. Um, and if you see here from this graphic, you'll notice that there's a number, I believe here is listed 14 domains uh, that make up the uh, National Information Exchange Model. Uh, we were not considered a domain because at the time uh, we sort of shied away and thought, oh no, not, a, not another standard. Um, and we decided that we weren't going to model um, 
anything in a traditional domain and model setting. So we were a community of interest and how we sort of got there was we started speaking with um, meme, meme community members and potential health stakeholders, um, understanding what their business needs and requirements were. And we soon kind of found out that what they needed first and foremost was just um, a forum to start talking about uh, their different questions that they had for health information exchange, education um, on the, the world of health IT and the various um, terminology and messaging standards, um, and being able to sort of facilitate collaboration um, amongst the various organizations and domains themselves. So we stood up this community of interest and we also produced a number of documents that are um, for anyone to view on the meme GitHub site, which we can um, post that link there as well. Uh, the first two documents really serve as educational pieces talking about various standards and uh, protection around health information. Um, the other ones talk about how you can leverage existing health information uh, standards in what's called an information exchange package document, uh, which is uh, how information within NEEM um, is, is packaged and is able to sort of enable this enterprise information sharing uh, in a standardized way uh, through various schemas and such. And then um, we've also took a look at meme and some of the domains who have already modeled um, health elements within their domain. Um, there, we uncovered about 350, so we've produced an inventory of those and began a mapping of those existing health elements uh, to uh, HL7 and other uh, health IT standards. Uh, one thing that we also started realizing as we were doing this work is Though we don't think meme is going to be used to, you know, uh, send an entire EHR and patient record, um, it there's what we're calling edge case scenarios. So if you want to go to the next slide, uh, we're sort of coining these edge case scenarios, and they are use cases, um, scenarios, and use cases that are outside of your typical um, traditional healthcare provider setting. Um, and they touch on different meme domains, such as emergency management, military operations, human services. Um, so here's a few of what we've pinpointed and we thought were real um, important to the nation um, that we kind of uncovered. At the same time, the FHA was sunsetting and that meant that there was going to be a gap and uh, no one was going to, we, we didn't know who was going to be leading this meme health work. So we started uh, speaking with different organizations and agencies individually, and then uh, we supported the NEEM Management Office back in August of last year to try to identify a new um, lead, whether it be for a community of interest or if they were going to stand up a NEEM Health uh, domain and thought this may be a good starting point. If you go to the next slide, uh, you'll take a, you'll be able to see some of uh, the community of interest accomplishments, accomplishments, as well as our recommendations um, to continue that mapping um, of those existing health elements and that inventory that we created in NEEM to continue that ma mapping based off of USCDI, which is uh, United States Corps for Data Inter Interoperability as well as to focus on those edge case scenarios and see how uh, NEEM can be leveraged to address social determinants of health, given that um, the, the, the domains that are in there, as well as the new statistics domain, we thought um, this would be something fantastic for uh, a new organization to start focusing on. Uh, one of the members of the FHA managing board as well as an attendee of that NEEM Health Symposium last August uh, was Rob Tagalakad. So I will pass it on to him, the main event, so he can talk a little bit further. And uh, Rob is the senior advisor to HHS's Office um, of Chief Information Officer. So I will pass it on to you, Rob. <clears throat> before Great. Rob, before I, be, mm -hmm. before I hand it over to you, let me just make, one, oh. I just put one slide up here, it's in the deck, that's fine. One of the things that we've done <laughs> is we've stood up the group on the hub. So, and, um, and Kate has, uh, has, uh, has agreed to be our, our curator on this group. And so um, this is just a screenshot from it. You'll see when you go on, 
that there is a fully functioning sub subsite within the, within the NIC. And there's lots of resources, there's a forum, there's events, there's lots of places to add communication, have discussion, post documents, videos, those kinds of things. So I just wanted to mention that up front so that uh, after this call, um, people can weigh in, they can you know, continue the conversation. We're creating some continuity here uh, for the ongoing conversations and questions and all those things that I'm sure will, will continue to percolate up over time. And now with that, let me turn that back over to Rob uh, for, uh, for, his, uh, for his presentation. And I want to thank you sure. for taking the time, Rob, and for, for preparing for this today. Great. Thank you very much, Daniel. And thank you, Kate, for the uh, introduction. If we can get to this, uh, the slide, uh, I want to thank everybody on this call, and I look forward to this engagement. And I don't mean uh, a dog and pony show. I mean uh, engagement, and hopefully not only in this forum, but in future ones. And so I'll start off by saying that in uh, fall of 2019, some background information is in order. In addition to what Kate had outlined, the NEAM Program uh, Management Office approached HHS through the Office of the Chief Information Officer on formally stewarding uh, the NEAM Health Domain. And that domain would build upon the existing uh, NEAM Health Community of Interest that was supported by uh, what uh, Kate mentioned, that federal line of business, the federal health architecture that is now retired. And so stewardship, uh, as we discussed it back in the fall, would entail a convening and decision-making infrastructure comprising stakeholders like yourselves on the call to promote uh, solutions in digital health. And as we will outline later, not all stakeholders are in the health business per se, and that will become clearer as we talk about it. The community approached HHS as the logical partner and steward of the health domain, premised on the assumptions that I outlined in the slide that you can read for yourself, but I'd like to highlight a, a few of them. One, uh, we know that health is now really equivalent to digital health, uh, that health outcomes are dependent on multi, uh, multiple variables uh, outside of uh, the clinical realm as well as within the, that clinical realm, and that health involves multiple domains as we kind of talked about and that we'll uh, talk about some more as we, we go along. And so the context of this engagement today is to discuss the business proposal that I was asked to develop uh, after that meeting for standing up the NEAM Health Domain and uh, some of the context uh, that I outlined here in the slide. Uh, if I can get to that next slide, uh, Daniel, I'm so sorry. Uh, great. Uh, the context is uh, uh, this, the proposal was not an end product. It was really a, uh, a way of coalescing what we've been discussing to this point in time and then uh, engaging people on that idea. And the question, uh, the three questions that we tried to attend to that came up over and over is, what is the problem statement uh, uh, that mean health domain is trying to solve? What is the investment that is required? And what is the return of, on investment uh, on that investment or that original investment? And one of the other assumptions, as I, I think I've uh, outlined already, is it will require multiple domains. And again, that will become clear as we, we go forward. So uh, if I can, we can go to the next slide. Um, like any strategic plan, uh, the business proposal is informed by an environmental scan, namely trends in technology, policy, and industry. And in this slide, we already know firsthand of the explosion of technology Nonetheless, what's, what still takes our breath away is the rapidity and the breadth of that proliferation. And hopefully uh, it, it gives you a sense of our urgency uh, in this space. So over the last decade, the private and public sectors have been generating data at an unprecedented rate. So by 2025, the International Data Corporation says worldwide data will grow 61, 61% to 175 uh, zettabytes with as much of the data residing in the cloud as in data centers. And that the capacity uh, to exchange that data has expanded exponentially as well. In its paper visual networking uh, index forecasts and trends, Cisco has projected the following worldwide. And I think this gives you again the sense of the urgency and the breadth uh, of, of this explosion. 
there will be 28.5 billion network devices by 2020, and that's up by uh, 10, uh, over 10 billion, uh, up from 18 billion in 2017. Machine-to-machine -machine connections, which really is becoming the foundation to digital health, will be more than half of the global connected devices and connections uh, by 2020, from 34% in 2017 to 51%. And lastly, of the estimated 14.16 billion machine-to-machine -machine connections, 22% will be in connected health, for example, healthcare monitoring. But against that, however, mm -hmm. is the, despite the technological advances, despite these trends, we all know that comprehensive data interoperative uh, interoperability frameworks are lacking that would enable local, state, national, and cross-border health information exchange. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of some of the drivers, uh, I'm not going to dwell uh, much on this. Uh, I think most of you are quite aware of the numerous laws that have been passed that have incrementally supported digital health. One, uh, HIPAA and administrative simplifications, and that which required healthcare organizations to adopt national standards for electronic data exchange. And largely this is in support of, data, of healthcare payments. Um, uh, most of you already know the implementation nationwide as well as internationally of ICD-10 uh, or the international uh, classification and disease codes. Uh, high-tech, which included the Medicare and Medicaid EHR incentive programs, ACA or the Affordable Care Act, the Cures Act, and TEFCA, and notably, the, uh, which includes the disincentives, disincentives or penalties for blocking information sharing. And then uh, what may not be considered uh, health IT, but uh, clearly an influencer in this space is the Evidence Act, which outlines expectations for government agencies to improve their capacity to engage in data-driven and evidence-based decision makings. So if you look at that, uh, that whole gestalt or milieu uh, in terms of uh, legislation and regulations, what I'd like to highlight <coughs> is, is that uh, over time, uh, digital health is incentivized largely through payment policy under the umbrella of interoperable data sharing. And secondly, the policy trends go beyond the focus of healthcare payments that uh, uh, 15 years ago, but digital health exchange as facilitating health outcomes at the individual and community levels. Again, most of you in the call would already know that. And the other key trend that I'd like to mention, but I won't uh, go into uh, to depth in this call, uh, but I'm sure uh, I'd like to have a conversa uh, future conversation is the role of social determinants of health and uh, in its report, McKinsey's report, capturing improved healthcare outcomes and ROI or return on investment, we look really to the CMS and the state Medicaid programs. Uh, for example, the CMS waivers, the 1115 demonstration waivers, and the Medicaid federal financial participation matching funds that help support data and analytics infrastructure modifications rela related to social determinants of health or SDOH. So you look at that and you're looking at the incentivizing of digital health and uh, an SDOH as part of it, which is not strictly clinical health or which is not clinical health, uh, but about other things. Next slide, please. And so finally, in terms of drivers, uh, I'd like to point out um, something that uh, was outlined in the Digital Health Consumer Adoption of 2019 by Rock Health and Stanford University is, is that there's an overwhelming desire of patients uh, to share that data, but the question is, to whom do they want to share that data? And it's clearly not the big tech companies, but clearly their providers uh, in order to get them better health, uh, better health outcomes, uh, and quite frankly, at a better price. And then as we look at the cutting edge, everyone has seen the news in the last three months, the last 90 days. Amazon, Comprehend, uh, Comprehend Medical addresses issues of unstructured data from EHRs, Google's uh, clouds, uh, artificial inte intelligence and um, machine learning, uh, supporting healthcare organizations like Ascension to improve healthcare experience. 
so forth and so on. And you, and you just look at the venture capital that is being thrown at, for example, uh, tele, uh, telehealth. Uh, and in fact, JP Morgan conference uh, uh, just recently in San Francisco outlines, and I won't go through it here in detail, but please look at their website of where the venture capital is going. And that is reshaping the way that we're doing health. And that is largely digital health. So next slide. So we really come to the core business case. And I think I stated just uh, a few minutes earlier, despite these technological advances, despite the trends, uh, the comprehensive data interoperability frameworks are still lacking in this space that would enable the local, state, national, and cross-border health information exchange. And I'd like to kind of, uh, kind of pivot really quickly on why cross-border health information exchange we're looking now at the coronavirus uh, and uh, how that's being proliferated from Wuhan, China, throughout China, and now into the United States. And, you know, several colleagues on this call already know that, that uh, the information exchange in this space is very important. And so Robert? the context – yes, yes, sir. You know, let me just jump in here for one second. This is fantastic. I just want to dwell – I just want to uh, ask you just a second about the – this comprehensive data interoperability framework, which is, mm -hmm. is kind of the holy grail. Uh, and I think people are sort of salivating on the phone here saying, oh, my God, this is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. when, I just wanted to pose you a question to say, when you're thinking about this and when HHS is thinking about this, are you thinking about it in the global sense of when we talk about six domains, we're talking about uh, not only healthcare and electronic clinical data exchange and pharmacy data and all those things, which is, really important, but in the context of the other social, public safety, education, other domains that have, as we talked about early on, some of the, some of the, um, some of the edge cases, that just if you yeah. spend a second uh, helping us think about that a second. Right. So in the beginning, thank you, Daniel. That's a, that's a great clarifying question. So the answer is uh, definitely yes. And the yes is we're looking at it from a global perspective on several levels. One, is that uh, from a global perspective, like I just talked about, and in sharing information between states and, and, and different kinds of information to a global perspective is that it involves multi, uh, multiple domains. So it's not just health and just clinical health. We're talking about public health. We're talking about e emergency management. We're talking about education. We, yes, we're talking about health IT uh, as outlined in the paper, but also as outlined in NEEM, we're talking about mili military operations. We're talking about, you know, uh, VA uh, and uh, DOD have a large health component as part of that network uh, across the nation uh, and as well as regionally. So we're talking about that globally. What I'd like to say, and, and I'll, I'll kind of feel my own thunder uh, as we, we go along, okay. is that while we think globally, we also have to think specifically what are the discrete opportunities here and now, not to boil the ocean, that we can uh, uh, proceed to, uh, to uh, realize that global perspective. But we have to sometimes, as they say, healthcare is local. Sometimes healthcare is, is regional. So what are the discrete opportunities? And I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, I think it's important to hear, you know, as, mm -hmm. um, as we go through these calls, to, you know, to reiterate that that is part of the framework because, you know, some, for many years it was, it was, oh, we'll get to that when we, you know, mm -hmm. after we've, you know, fixed healthcare, so to speak. And now with right. social determinants so much on people's lips, you know, it's, it's finally right. become a very current thing is the action sort of supporting the language as well in terms of recognition, in terms of, um, uh, you know, work, you know, cross, cross agency work groups, are there people coming mm -hmm. together to represent those voices in this, in this, uh, in this larger conversation? Right. And, and I just like to reiterate that the premise of the health domain is really about multi-sector, multi-domain collaboration, mm -hmm. because we know, for example, SDOH, your zip code is, a, a, is a likely to predict, uh, forecast your health outcomes as much as, as, as clinical ones or even more so. And so those social determinants of health are non-clinical. Uh, and right. so when we talk about, so we, I like to just double down on that concept that when we talk about global, that's what we mean. 
So right. if we can go to the next slide, would that be great? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the strategy. It kind of segues into our strategy. And actually, this is an evolution of the original business proposal, because there are now four instead of three. But let me go through them. One is aligning the NEEM health elements across the domains. And it's in, in essence, uh, taking what uh, Kate had talked about earlier, there was a lot of work under the federal health architecture. Uh, that we can leverage today. Why recreate the wheel when it's already there on the hub, on GitHub, for example, and then using that information to map, for example, to uh, existing, emerging, and some more than emerging, I think, the uh, generally accepted uh, health information exchange, uh, for example, FHIR, Smart on FHIR, et cetera. So that's the first strategy. The second strategy is to focus on health information exchange in non-traditional settings or edge case scenarios. Because so there's a lot of work already being done at the clinical, uh, um, I'll say, it's not a, a domain per se, but the clinical domain or subdomain. And so why recreate the wheel or why uh, duplicate that effort? We do need to have that interaction with that subdomain, if you will. And I put that in air quotes again. But when we talk about SDOH, we're talking about, again, those non-traditional settings. When we're talking about, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the coronavirus and how it's tra uh, transferring, how, what kind of things do we need to deploy? It's beyond clinical. And so those are the things where we see value with the health domain, with our, uh, our, uh, our collaboration with Nick and the partners around the table, that's where we think we can uh, achieve uh, greater value. And number three is to leverage the learning of these multi collaboratives. I like what you, you said, uh, Daniel, this is a network of networks. And yes, uh, we, this is a learning environment. It presupposes a learning environment and leveraging that learning into the next iteration of our thinking. And so fourthly is to find immediate opportunities to de demonstrate uh, value. And hence, the reason why of this business proposal, again, over, uh, over and over, people are saying, hey, that's nice, Rob, uh, that's pie in the sky, <laughs> but what are we trying to achieve? And I say, no, we're not trying to boil the ocean, and we're trying to take that vision into something discreet, and we'll talk about that later, because it'll be, and I'm intentionally leading, because one of the questions that I, I asked at the beginning is, what discreet opportunity uh, uh, of the callers who, who've joined us do you think we should focus on? And yes, well, there'll be additional uh, uh, leading questions. So next, uh, so next slide. Great. And again, <laughs> this is maybe the tripling down on the SDOH, but I'd like to acknowledge um, Evelyn Gallegos, who actually wrote this up, and I stole, uh, stole it wholesale and, and dumped it into this presentation because I think she captured very well why uh, SDOH uh, matters and why SDOH integration in clinical uh, care is important and how NEEM could uh, help address that. And again, I won't dwell on it because uh, uh, it's already on, 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 on Nick, it's already uh, on the slide, but clearly there is need in terms of de data definitions, coding gaps, uh, addressing the disparate uh, data collection and the misalignment of guidance and incentives in the space. And I think this group, as well as NEEM, can help address uh, those, um, I'll say, lackings or, or gaps. So uh, let's quickly pivot really to, oh, and maybe I should uh, um, uh, touch, touch a little bit on ROI. So the one thing that people were saying, uh, have, were saying is, if we're going to invest, um, then what, what kind of benefit are we going to get? And I used a NEEM uh, case study. And the Department of Defense created uh, on this kind of uh, uh, unwieldy, but it's the Warfighter Mission Area Architecture Federation and Integration Portal. Well, this portal is an open source centralized hub for architecture information on all DOD's capabilities. What is the capability in terms of DOD? The capability is defined as anything that, is a war, that a warfighter uses to do their job, whether it's a tank, whether it's a communication device, an IP service, et cetera. It sounds, it has analogies to healthcare. 
and, in, and NEEM enabled DOD to share its architecture data dictionaries in a single simplified and integrated view. Now with the information in a standardized structure and format, DOD can analyze and share information more effectively even as DOD's capabilities evolve and grow. And it's to leverage and deploy those capabilities across the world, not only nation, nationally, but across the world. And in their return on investment, they've documented that they've uh, I've seen hard cost savings of at least $4 million annually. And uh, this business plan, our business plan that I'm talking about, we were talking about five years. You know, if we could even replicate that, we can look at $20 million in five years. But, you know, um, before we go to the next slide, the most significant cost savings, and I think I'm preaching to the choir here, we – the, the significant cost savings will be realized in actual health outcomes enabled through digital health. And while both the public and private sectors are working to quantify hard and soft ROI for digital health, you know, the, the following macro example is uh, really instructive. So uh, I think uh, many of you are already uh, familiar with IQBIA, the Institute for Human Data Science, and they conducted a study and the growing value, called the growing value of digital health. And they showed strong evidence now that the use of digital health app applications or apps and the associated exchange and use of actual data enabled by these apps reduce mm -hmm. acute care utilization in five patient populations. And, and I think many of you in healthcare, uh, and I think uh, one of my co former colleagues from UCSF, would attest, you know, it's diabetes or diabetes prevention, asthma, cardiac uh, rehabilitation, pulmonary rehabilitation. And in just those five areas, the uh, healthcare system uh, is estimated to save seven billion, with a B, per year. And so I think the promise of inter interoperable healthcare is possible. But again, vis-a-vis -vis the reality that we don't have that, uh, that, uh, that network, if you will, of inter, uh, interoperable data exchange that we're talking about. So let me go a little bit further on the, the partnership model because it will take a network of networks, and if you can change a great, uh, to the partnership model, and it really borrows on the NEEM health model. What we're looking at is creating a a convening and decision-making infrastructure vis-a-vis uh, -vis this partnership model. Uh, uh, very much like the uh, NEEM, it will have an executive steering committee with a NEEM Health PMO uh, that will have two committees that will help realize uh, the solutions uh, in terms of both the business and the technical pieces of this equation and find discrete solutions in order to uh, move the, the proverbial needle forward. And again, this will require several prospective partners. It's not only HHS and the federal partners within HHS, the CMS, the NIH, the ACF, it is beyond that. And what we're talking about really is our work with uh, with uh, Google and Amazon. We're talking about our work with Veterans Affairs, as we're talking about the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, uh, major uh, or the myriad industry partners like HL7, and the stewards of change right here now, the stakeholders that comprise this collaborative. And so, again, I'd, uh, we can do a deep dive later and in, in maybe another uh, uh, session but I think this is conceptually what we uh, foresaw in this business proposal. And if we can go to the next uh, slide, uh, we our articulated a possible roadmap, and this is with our help with our name PMO and uh, with Iris Health Partners. And so I'd like to talk top level about the stages, and then I'd like to talk about uh, some of the uh, kind of ideas, and again, I'd like to reiterate some of the questions. What, do, what are we getting right here? What are we missing? And what are the discrete, tangible opportunities to move this forward uh, so that we can actually see, uh, uh, get re a return on investment? 
But we saw, foresaw this over uh, multiple years, um, uh, stage one, two, to three, and four. Um, as, as Kate had outlined, uh, there's a lot of work that has already been done under the former federal health architecture. There's been a lot of work done with HIMSS and stewards of change. Let's leverage that learning and then do the things that we saw in stage one and two. And maybe one of the discrete things is start mapping the NEEM health, uh, health elements to uh, HL7, to fire, to, uh, to the things that already exist as, a, as we were talking about in the beginning. And then we would work our way in, in normalizing the health domain operations. And what I mean by that is really what we're doing now, but in a much more formal way and like any standards uh, organization, begin to uh, understand what standards should we employ and then deploy rapidly. So this is more than just a standards or, or uh, talking about a standards organization. We're talking about really now identifying amongst the partners, what are the opportunities for implementation? And then in stages three and four, it's really to build the capacity to identify and prioritize the edge case scenarios. Uh, Kate and myself and Daniel have outlined some of the things that we already are thinking about. There are plenty more, but the question is, again, not to boil the ocean, what are the discrete opportunities uh, based on the priorities that we've seen? And yes, from an HHS point of view, I know what the secretary's uh, uh, priorities are, for example, in opioid, but there are other priorities uh, that we may share around the table it could be opioid, it could be other things, public health emergency, uh, more focused uh, uh, exchange. Uh, again, the coronavirus comes to mind. And so we should identify uh, that. And the concept of this is not everyone has all the resources. And so the question becomes in this business proposal is how do we share resources uh, across uh, one organizations and domains? And finally, uh, part of the stage four, and again, these are uh, these can be seen sequentially. These can be seen uh, coextensive with each other. Is how do we deliver on those particular solutions once we prioritize? And so, if I can go to the last slide, um, that is really the focus of the key questions. And and I'd love to to engage you now on those key questions. What else do we need to consider in creating the health domain? And this could be the advice to not only to, uh, to the stewards of change, to HHS, but to others as we consider this. And what are the immediate opportunities that we should be leveraging NEEM uh, or the opportunities to leverage NEEM, uh, of course, stewards uh, uh, of change and, and, uh, and, and the like to demonstrate immediate value or return on investment. And again, uh, if I'm a little bit leading, forgive me, but one of the things that uh, already, <laughs> already now uh, in the hopper, as there's two things, the one that I neglected to, but one of them is Project Unify, a proof of concept for data sharing and person ma matching. And I'm going to segue that to Daniel. The other one, just before we leave, and I think uh, 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 Brian Hanspicker may, uh, may jump in, as well as uh, some colleagues from ISL, on um, PMIX. Uh, Gene Hall, I know you're on the line, but on uh, the um, prescription uh, drug uh, use or prescription use. So those are the kind of things that we're thinking about. So I'll stop there, and I hand it back over to you, Daniel. <clears throat> bravo, bravo. <clears throat> Let me say thank you for that. That was a lot. A great overview, um, and I'm glad we have your slides um, to <laughs> be able to refer to it. <laughs> Um, right. I know it's hard to deliver a lot of that information, but that's great. I mean, it's very, I'm excited and enthusiastic about uh, kind of the openness, the vision, the opportunities that uh, you've laid out there. And the, and the, I particularly like the, the partnership and the collaboration that you're outlining in terms of moving this forward, which is really for everybody who's on the phone who's NEEM involved, probably at the, at the root core, the, the, you know, the ethical core of NEEM is to make it a collaborative process here. So you're right there. Um, I think that everybody, who's been involved with our work and uh, uh, lately is really the propensity to action. And the fact that you've actually stated that is, is really terrific. And um, what I'll do is I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I know we want to talk a little bit about Project Unify. Uh, and there's a bunch of people on the call here who've been uh, committed uh, to working in that area. 
Um, and so we can talk about that as well. But let me just open it up for a second. And um, I know there's a couple of questions that have come in uh, on the on the on the comments here. Um, but uh, let me let me open it up and, and maybe actually throw it over to uh, to Dave Walsh if you're on just to say a few words. I know that you're probably foaming at the mouth. We're ready to ready to jump in here. I, I sure am, Daniel. Thank you. So, Rob, I really appreciate everything that I heard. It was a bit like drinking from a fire hose, though. There's a lot of information there. One question that I have, and I'm very active in this Project Unify uh, movement going forward, and our goal is really to uh, build open source frameworks upon which people can build value. So instead of everybody reinventing the wheel over and over again, rather have a foundational framework that people can start from and takes care of a lot of the technical details. Now, one mm -hmm. of the biggest things that we're uh, running into, and maybe you could help us, is uh, that to the best of my knowledge, Fire, I mean, uh, Neem is more of a data model, whereas mm -hmm. Fire is more about a data model and the standards by which you uh, communicate that data in a secure manner. So one of the questions that I had, and this is going to be more and more relevant as we see things like the coronavirus outbreaks, the real-time nature of exchanging this data, uh, data is going to be more and more important. So as you look at Neem, are you aware of any initiatives to transport that data and to address the security that's going to be needed in the transportation of that data? Well, I am only aware, <laughs> and this will round back to uh, Project uh, Unify. I, I, I have seen certain things that I, uh, I've seen in terms of Project Unify. I've seen things that, for example, in, uh, and hopefully uh, Brian Hansberger later on can talk about the PMIX, uh, PMIX uh, architecture. And yes, I understand well, what we're talking about in terms of you know, the, uh, the data model. And uh, for me, and uh, c correct me if I'm wrong, Kate and, and others from Neem, it's more than a data model. And so I think what uh, this we, is where Brian. Val Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. I was just going to, I thought there was a pause there. I was just going to point out that um, actually there's been a good deal of discussion of uh, an idea that Dave Walsh first proposed of, mm -hmm. uh, doing, uh, of exchanging Neem messages over the FIRE protocol. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the FIRE uh, information exchange protocol is, uh, I shouldn't say really nothing more than, it's, it's quite a bit more than just, but uh, um, using HTTPS um, to access RESTful services. And th these are things like get and put and delete. Uh, and this is the way most of the name implementations that I've seen in the past have actually been implemented anyway. So it's not a big stretch to, to assert, oh, sure, we'll do Neem on fire, or even better, uh, Neem on smart on fire, where smart is a set of agreements on exactly which uh, uh, authorization authentication services you use um, in, order to, uh, in order to exchange or get access to the information. So the, right. there's, there's some nascent work here, and I presented this to my colleagues at the Neem Technical Architecture Committee, and they were actually really intrigued with the idea. Since Neem is just a data model, we do not have any uh, standards or implementers agreements on how to exchange the information, even though so many of the implementations just use RESTful. Hey, maybe there's an opportunity here to sort of move the bar a little bit to say, yeah, we don't have a standard for it, but we certainly have an implemented agreement for how most folks would exchange the messages, and it just happens to exactly align with how fire exchanges messages. Mm -hmm. Over. If I can jump in and just add a little more, um, it's Tom Carlson. Mm -hmm. the, um, yeah, it's the thing with Neem is that Neem has a very tight scope, 
And when it comes to things like privacy and security, it punts that to higher levels. Um, it does have some things. For example, there's a PHI indicator in the human services um, uh, domain that you can, it's metadata and you can apply to anything, but all you're really doing is saying, hey, this should be treated as PHI information. NEEM itself doesn't do anything to enforce that. Uh, NEEM, We're NEEM, working on that for NEEM 5. Uh, yeah, Tom. yeah, yeah. So right now, NEEM doesn't enforce it. It's just like stamping a folder top secret. Stamping it top secret doesn't keep anybody from opening it and looking into it. So NEEM has traditionally punted that to higher levels. Um, I'm, I'm really antsy to be start getting on NTAC calls so I can find out what's coming for five. Right. You should be getting that call any day now. We just talked about you yesterday. <laughs> That's a scary thought. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I hope that answers your question. But uh, as as I hear it, and I like to reiterate it or summarize it, it does. Uh, they don't seem to be mutually exclusive, and uh, to build upon each other uh, may be the way to to go. And and they, and as Brian and Tom have, have articulated, maybe that is and. It'll, and maybe in another call, talk about more of the specifics of how we would align them. That makes sense. I think uh, one of the big issues with interoperability, if people are, are tending to use RESTful interfaces to access NEEM, that's a good thing, but mm -hmm. there's enough leeway in that to say, this person is doing it slightly differently from this person, and that's kind of the death knell of interoperability if everybody's close, but nobody's exact. So anything that right. you hear in that space, I uh, really appreciate hearing about it. Right. And I want to just, uh, can I just add a little counterpoint to this? Uh, I, I agree with everything you're talking about. I think the idea of using fire to be uh, uh, the transport mechanism and mm -hmm. understanding that NEEM is about semantic interoperability primarily, mm -hmm. but NEEM, NEEM is also a methodology. There's a uh, well-established, and Tom knows this better than anybody, of, uh, approach to how do you come up with actual exchanges that follow mm -hmm. a set of naming and design rules that follow some, some uh, steps towards doing this. For example, in the early days of NEEM, we actually spent a lot of time coming up with data elements without thinking about why are we doing this and what value do they have until we figured out we better be looking at the scenarios and the use cases that uh, mm -hmm. upon which exchanges are, are important to develop. Uh, but that whole methodology has been very useful. And I think taking into account the idea of IEPDs and the idea of the naming and design rules and the, the governance structures, which Rob has outlined very nicely as a, a way to build out an individual domain and consistent with the governance structure. There's more to this than just the data model. And I, I understand the desire to get into the technical details of, you know, how do you do this messaging and what does it consist of, but I think the methodology has something to offer here as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm glad you, you, you mentioned the methodology and, and, and that was my, my point. It was more than a data model. It is the methodology and sometimes the methodology can help with, uh, I'll call it the madness uh, of interoperability. And so I think that's uh, something to look into as well. And again, um, and they're not mutually exclusive in terms of uh, governance or in terms of uh, data and data exchange. Throwing it back to you. So I'm, I'm just leaving the, uh, the space open for others to jump in with comments mm -hmm. or questions. Yeah, this is uh, Sonia Kim with Alexandria Consulting. Um, Robert, when you were speaking about you know, ROI and working from a global perspective, I was just wondering your stance on, I mean, as far as you were saying the proliferation of data and new technologies, what is your stance on 
supporting more open source projects because, I mean, if you're talking about integration, um, embracing open source would, you know, help in that regard because you're basically addressing the fact that um, when you're dealing with closed source uh, software providers, uh, sometimes they have a business objective to, uh, you know, not necessarily integrate with other um, other systems, and so it's almost one of these mm -hmm. things where there's a proliferation of technologies, and yet the integration aspect is being hindered. So, you know, when you're talking about um, ROI and then really uh, pushing integration, you know, the support of the source, I would think, would be um, much more embraced, but I don't see a lot of that happening. Right. You know, so my my position is really where I see the, you know, where we've gone legislatively. Uh, and I happen to agree philosophically about uh, open open source. And so um, that I, I, I want to make, um, make a, an emphatic statement, I guess, that um, what I articulating here is really a reflection of where I think both, uh, by and large, industry, uh, in, in this interoperability space, and I'm, I'm not talking about vendors per se, um, and like groups like this have been advocating. And so the, that, uh, that both that philosophy and that practice, uh, that would be my position. The question becomes, uh, I understand that uh, what really, and I have yet to see this really, uh, because I, I remember a case study, which I haven't outlined here, but I'd like to share maybe in some different form or maybe in, in writing and share it in, on the hub, is where NASA had looked at, you know, uh, two things. And I'll, again, uh, I'm, I'm struggling to remember the, the details, but it was, open, it was basically open source versus not. And the, the cost savings, the hard cost savings, was on the former, where there was open source and the use of that. And so uh, if, I, if I can share that later on, but there are some specifics, and they engaged, uh, I believe it either was uh, Booz Allen Hamilton or even McKinsey, in helping them articulate very clearly those two cases and the return on investment, and again, uh, identifying where and I believe, and I, I, this number is, for every dollar spent, uh, there was a dollar fourteen in savings. And so, fourteen fourteen uh, percent was pretty good in terms of, you know, when you're talking about NASA and the kind of uh, spending that they do. So, I'd like to share that, uh, but that would be my perspective. Or Rob, that would be a great thing. Life. That would be a great thing to put on the uh, on the new Nick Neem uh, health. Mm -hmm. Uh, hub and uh, as a potential blog article for it. And with your approval, yep. I, I'm willing to post um, some more details from your talk on uh, that uh, Neem Health blog as well. This Very is good. Thank over. you. Yeah, Very and to, thank you. to your open source comments, uh, Rob, um, mm -hmm. when I look at open source, I kind of look at two versions of it. One is that it is a place where companies who are tired of their software and still feel that some people get value of it retire their software too. And mm -hmm. the other is a very active community. So I think its value proposition really uh, falls into the court, uh, category of having a vibrant community who is adding to it who is mm -hmm. implementing it and so forth. So as much as being able to get the bits off of Git, that's one thing, but having a community that continues to understand what the issues are, enhances it, supports it, and so forth. I think that's our key to going forward with uh, Project Unify. Right. And, and I'm glad you articulated that way. Uh, that's how, uh, what I really meant about the philosophy. It's that, that uh, ability to exchange. And yes, there is value uh, to be had uh, from that exchange in an open way and open source way. So th thank you for that, uh, uh, for that insight. Sure. Cool. 
Other comments and thoughts? I'm gonna keep it open here. Uh, this is Paul Wormley again. Uh, Rob, I, hey, Paul. <clears throat> answering your first question, <clears throat> what else do we need to consider in creating the health domain? I think nothing beats uh, getting people's attention than demonstrating the value proposition mm -hmm. that along the lines of what you talked about. And in your strategy, uh, I, I think early on of actually creating, however that's done, some kind of actual uh, on the bricks demonstration of interoperability, for, for example, and using uh, connecting people that are using named versus those that are using fire or some combination thereof to show mm -hmm. that that uh, power and to, then to collect real data on the ROI so that that's what mm -hmm. that's what the rest of the country will follow. And I think the more you can build those demonstration projects into the early stages of your strategy, as mm -hmm. uh, the IEP the IEPDs are important, but so is finding some place in the country to to trust it and and not to just do alpha tests, but also beta tests where you show the replication potential and the scalability of these kinds mm -hmm. of exchanges. I think that's a that's really the driving thing to me to get this off the ground is to put something in place that people can see, touch, feel, read about, you know, show their funding bodies that this does add value. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Paul, uh, because one of the things, one, another senior advisor uh, at the Health and Human Services, you know, came to me and said, you know, in order to move this forward, he said almost exactly what you just said, and, it, uh, and he asked me, is there something scalable? And so, uh, and to show that kind of value, uh, not only in that, uh, in, uh, in a small sense, but uh, something in a larger sense. And I don't mean the health con concern, but that again, it is scalable and that uh, the funders will be willing to put that money in and then claim success actually uh, in, in different ways, whether that's a, uh, on the bottom line or whether that's on a larger perspective of health outcomes uh, or whether it's just, it's just from a project point of view, I've, I've completed from A to B to C and see, and see the use of that vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the return on investment, but again, focused more on, 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 pro on the project itself. So I think all those things, the way that we articulate value can be had. And so uh, again, I think you know, uh, as part of this conversation, as this part of this ongoing conversation is to begin to hone what, uh, what are those opportun immediate opportunities uh, for, uh, to show value and, the, uh, and scalability as we, talked, as we just talked about. So cool, thank you. <clears throat> Other, um, you're gonna wait to say anything else here? Um, Eric just posted a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Robert, I don't know if you see your chat open here. I could read it, but it's uh, um, yeah. well, let me try a, thoughtful, a, a thoughtful comment oh, here. from Eric. Uh, I see the utility of using fire APIs verbatim for communicating clinical systems, but how could we, how could, how would strict, how could strict fire well, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, be so beyond fire. So <laughs> I don't know, you know, quite frankly, I don't know the answer. I do know the question and I do know the problem because um, one of the things, and uh, forgive me if I, I'm uh, dichotomizing this, bifurcating this unnecessarily so, but I see the value clearly uh, in the clinical realm and fire and smart and fire. Um, and so where I, I, I'm coming from a question of how do we do that in non-clinical settings, particularly in the edge cases that we're talking about. And so I do have, it's a question, and I, I, I can't answer that other than I think we, uh, I think uh, when we talk about fire, these have been and other things, I think we need to answer that question, that problem, when we talk about healthcare at the edge. And, and quite frankly, uh, my perspective on this, is, I know I'm getting some feedback from somebody in the background. Yeah, hang on. But I think yeah, you, I was just looking. Yeah, go ahead. Cool. Go ahead. Great. 
Um, what I what I see is oh shoot, I just lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> let me try to recapture it. Well, where I see actually a large part of the value, or where I see a lot of the data is, again, uh, if you're looking at SEOH just as a, as, as a use case, and where uh, the health outcomes are determined uh, somewhat on clinical uh, care, anywhere from uh, depending on which model you use, anywhere from 10% to 20%, and a large part is SDOH. We have to resolve that I issue, and can NEEM help us? Uh, do that. I, I have a, a particular uh, a bias, a particular answer in this, uh, hence this business proposal that Neem can. And so uh, I'd like to explore that. But again, I don't want to boil the ocean. I'd like to identify where we could use it vis-a-vis -vis each other. Uh, again, they're not mutually exclusive. So anyway. Yes, uh, Eric Young here. I posted the comment. Yeah, I, I definitely feel whenever you're communicating with a clinical system, and, and I think SDOH, even if it's not pure clinical, it could be you know public health or such. I think I think falls under uh, you know some sort of fire usage. But I'm just really concerned about you know broadly speaking, you know saying meme usage through fire as a general purpose tool. Then I get a little concerned when you're outside of a healthcare you know, context. And so I, I would just, just, uh, I'm just hoping that, that either that this group's looking at the, the implications of, 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 you know, if everything that, uh, if you only have a hammer, everything is a nail, I feel like fire is being the new, the new uh, hammer and we need to look for other tools when, when we're in other domains that are not clinical or not public health or not even a, a meme health edge case. And so I just, mm -hmm. uh, but obviously this presentation is exactly about that. So I feel like I'm kind of changing topics. I just want to caution people that, you know, if we're talking with a HUD exchange with ACF and it's uh, maybe, uh, or maybe something with courts and, and uh, education, you know, there's no need for a patient observation perhaps, or necessarily one, uh, or, you know, the way they may structure their case plans in a social work context might be very different from anything, you know, hospitals or public health would, would encounter. That's, that's my only point. I just was hoping to scale fire to its healthcare related focus, not, not, um, memify fire in general. I, I've seen other problems, you know, just going through the fire APIs, I, I just kind of cringe at, at trying to shoehorn everything name does into that API. Right. I, I think point well taken, but I'd like to, to, you, uh, you know, bring us back to uh, why we're doing this. Well, at least I know why I'm doing this. Uh, I mean, I, I come from not a health, I mean an IT background, but from a health uh, background. And I come from a, a time working in the HIV AIDS epidemic. And one of the, the uh, standards of care was that we had to use a community of services that were not necessarily clinical uh, in order to ensure um, uh, the survival of, of, of folks with, with HIV and AIDS. And so as a person goes from one setting to another, whether that is a health setting, a mental health setting, whether that's uh, a public health, whether that's community health, uh, and then also different payment settings, how do we track a person to ensure uh, the kind of coordination of care and therefore under, uh, related to health outcomes uh, and positive health outcomes. How do we do that? And so therefore using that, and I don't mean to nemify or fireize uh, neem, I, I think we have to be clear what their value is vis-a-vis -vis each other. I get that point. But how can we ensure that person as that person crosses settings of care and whether or not a uh, more personal information is required or not, but re regardless, and maybe this goes to the question of do we, uh, do, do we need a patient identifier or a person identifier as they cross these settings? How can uh, the health domain and these multiple domains address that? One patient. So, so let me, uh, let me uh, say um, thank you for so much for taking the time to do this with us today. We are rapidly right. approaching 1.30.
Um, I think mm -hmm. we probably uh, raised uh, as many questions as have been answered, uh, which good. is oftentimes the, 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 the good point of this thing, which is great. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, just to uh, throw a little uh, one more area on here is there's a whole area of education, which has its own set of standards and the interaction again with when we're talking about SDOH, um, we need to include education. And even within mm -hmm. the early care and education field, home visiting or early ECE world, there's a lot of conversation around, you know, working to exchange that data through evidence-based practices up to the state and then up to the Fed that we've had some involvement with. So, you know, the, the conversation is certainly broad. And I, you know, I appreciate your sort of your 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 global perspective on this. I'm sure that uh, this point is well taken that we need to make sure we have our our, our visors wide open, our peripheral vision uh, quite open as mm -hmm. well. So um, I'm, I'm excited about the conversations that are going to ensue on this, and, and I'm going to uh, extend an invitation to come back soon. And uh, I think one of the things we can do is on the hub again, we can start to pose some of these very technical questions or some specific questions yes. and dive into them a bit. If you're okay with that, Rob, uh, we do that. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Absolutely. And, I think and, that, and of course, Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. You're go ahead. And, and well, and we have a we literally have a community uh, around us, uh, apparently uh, also on this call, who can weigh in yeah. and who are much more technically inclined than I am in order to tease out these issues. But again, towards a solution. So thank you. Right. And and to, toward that end, this idea of the project Unify is really a coming together of just a lot of. A lot of technical mm -hmm. uh, firepower, which is amazing to see people coming to the table with open source solutions uh, and way and real interest to build something in a collaborative space here, uh, which could actually very nicely synchronize with you know the the the, um, the 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 idea and the desire to actually put something out there very tangible, and mm -hmm. we ought to look at you know ways that some of the existing federal initiatives that are now continue to roll out whether or not it's integrated care for kids or some of the accountable health communities and some other things which are all going to be addressing these same issues they're all going to be dealing with mm -hmm. data exchange they're all going to be dealing with confidential you know a lot of these topics are very similar let's maybe try to innovate and maybe replicate as opposed to have everybody create the solutions i think there's a great right. opportunity up there right so mm -hmm. we'll um, we'll we'll post those uh on the um on the hub and we invite you uh, to participate blog and, and respond. It's often uh, wonderful to have a lot of voices on there. And so uh, with that, I want to just make one transition and we'll uh, move. Uh, we'll, give, uh, we'll shut off the, uh, the call here. So next week we have uh, a call on what do you do with all this data? So um, <laughs> Andy Krakow, uh, who uh, was formerly at the California Healthcare Foundation has uh, I graciously agreed to talk about his experience and knowledge and uh, approach to actually visualizing data, using it. Uh, we work together a lot on the open data uh, work in California and beyond, and Andy has really uh, gotten his arms around this. So it, it'll be a, 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 a related kind of conversation, but how do you actually communicate this stuff uh, broadly to your constituencies? Uh, and as I said pr uh, previously, we have, uh, we're now putting together uh, other webinars for the rest of the year. Well, up through in April and May, and uh, on social determinants, on uh, some of the other technical factors that are going on, some of the clinical, uh, some of the federal initiatives um, on ONC FAST and, and uh, some of the other ones. Um, and so we look forward to uh, everyone's participation, thoughts, involvement on it, and uh, your, uh, your commitment to the time and energy here. So with that, I want, again, I want to thank everyone, and uh, we'll see you next week at this time, if not on the hub Good before meeting. that. Good meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. You.